Valencia to work particularly with Nacho and Miguel on the confidential inquiry into perioperative fatalities number four, generally known as CPEF4. Last century, I can say, particularly when Mark Johnson, who did his PhD with me, and he did an enormous amount of work, we must not forget the contribution that Mark made. He asked the question, why do we kill as many horses as we do when we anaesthetise them? And it struck a chord with me as well, because my PhD had also been looking at that question, that under anaesthesia or associated with anaesthesia, we lose, by death, more horses than we do dogs, cats, and you'll be pleased to know also more than humans, where the death rate is the lowest. So the question is why? What's different about horses? And Mark very sensibly started with saying, well, what is the situation? What is the real situation, the death rate th around the world? And he set to collecting on paper, using mail, the mail, you know, letters through letterboxes, collecting data from clinics all over the world, um, what happened to their horses under anaesthesia. So each person filled in a diary. It was one line per horse with details about the horse, the procedure, the drugs that it had received, and most importantly, whether it was alive or dead at seven days after the procedure. And that formed the basis of Mark's PhD, which he got, I can't quite remember the date of his actual PhD, but the end of the last century. And then he set to with um, statisticians and myself to write this up as a scientific paper. Um, he wrote the preliminary studies up as CPEF1, which was 6,000 horses, I think. The, the original big study of CPEF2 was published in 2002 in Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia, the main veterinary anesthesia journal. And that reported a death rate in healthy horses um, undergoing surgery of nearly 1%. So one in a hundred horses would die because of the anesthesia or maybe the surgery with it, but the whole process of anesthesia. CPEF 3 to fill in the gap was comparing halothane with isoflurane. Now at the time of CPEF2, the main maintenance agent was halothane, which is used very, very little now. And isoflurane was coming on and it seemed appropriate to see whether there was a difference between isoflurane and halothane. And to cut a long story short, in terms of total death, there was no difference. But in fact, horses died from different things. And in terms of young horses, Halothane caused more cardiovascular problems. Isoflurane seemed to cause more um, other things, particularly injuries in recovery. So that was all done um, by 2004, reported this high death rate. And then it's 20 years now since CPEF 2 and quite a lot of things have changed. We hope we might have learned a few things from that and from other studies that have been done and we really need to know where we are now. CPEF 4 is the new version of that data collection to see what has changed in that 20 years in between and regular was the person who kicked it into action originally, pointing out that we really do need to know what's happened in these last 20 years. And Miguel has taken on the lead in making sure that we all do our bit and working so hard. And then Nacho put in all the expertise in the data collection and we now have on board two IT um, members. And what is a major change going from CPEF 2 to CPEF 4 is computer technology. It has enabled all the data collection to be done online over the ether. No filling in lines with your pencil, no 
sticking up envelopes and posting them and no individual data entry duplication. Mark put every single data point into an Excel spreadsheet by hand. This is now happening automatically. So it is very, very different. It allowed more data points per horse, certainly. Um, it, it in itself, because we've got more data points, it's proving quite a lot of work um, Miguel and Nacho are doing an awful lot of correcting errors and we're hoping that with the IT input now it's going to go onto a web-based system whereby the errors won't be allowed to be put in. I think that's, that's, that's a, a simple way of putting it. So that the information will go straight into the database, won't need the same sort of corrections of, of things that were wrong and will also enable immediate analysis so that your clinic, when you put your data in, you can see what your overall information is. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, the data collection ca carries on a pace. There are 27 countries and 95 clinics all contributing from all around the world. Um, and Nacho seems to get in um, between 100 and 200 cases a day that need to be sort of sorted and, and, and put into the database. So there's a huge amount of work is done on a, on a daily basis, but the data are all coming in. And we wish to get to the same number of general anaesthetics as CPEF2, which was 44,000 horses. So we're actually aiming at 45,000. And the hope is that we will have that by um, about June next year. The other difference or another difference between CPF2 and CPF4 is we are now including cases done understanding sedation. Um, because we've probably got newer drugs and we've learned other ways of using them and we've got equipment to deliver them by um, a syringe driver or a, a very controlled infusion, more and more things are being done quite complex procedures are being done on horses that are sedated but remain standing. And the idea is that this will get rid of the danger period of the recovery when the horse has got to wake up from a general anaesthetic and go from lying down to standing up without damaging itself. And that is certainly one of the major areas of disaster. The horse breaks a, a major bone in a leg and the only treatment is euthanasia. So that, that is quite a significant cause of death. So the idea is that standing procedures will get rid of all of that um, and hence they are being included in the data collection to see whether that really is the case. And I have to say that yes, we may kill uh, fewer of them, but we still end up with some dead horses post sedation. So it's still not 100% safe. healthy horse death rate was nearly 1% with CPEF2 and we are now at 0.6. So this is, this is definitely an improvement, which is, it, 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 it's a bit of a relief really that all these things that we've learned to do in terms of maintenance of anaesthesia and how to deal with the anaesthetized horse and how to use induction aids and so on, maybe some of that is actually making a difference and we are doing better. There's still lots of room for improvement, but it's certainly better. So what has CPEF achieved? Well, I think the original was the realization that we do kill quite a lot of horses. You would often talk to somebody and say, oh, I can't believe that, that, that figure. We don't kill any horses, but actually when you collect the data, you get the real answer. And yes, around the world, we were killing 1% of healthy horses that were otherwise healthy. The horses with colic and caesarean in particular, the death rate in those was, was higher. Um, but to a certain extent, those are not entirely unexpected deaths. Whereas a horse that has a minor orthopedic procedure uh, shouldn't die from its anesthetic, but, but it was nearly 1% of those that were dying. So it pointed out to the world that yes, these numbers are real. We've collected them from all over the world. We are assuming that people are being honest about the data. And yes, we are killing that many. So that, that was a great achievement of pointing out that 
equine anesthesia is not safe. And in fact, one of Mark's original sort of um, lines when he started off was, a chance to cut is a chance to kill. So, you know, you're going to do surgery, that's a good chance that you can kill a horse. Um, and, and that was really the case. I mean, so much so that um, when I, um, I, I have some horses and I would do my utmost to avoid needing general anaesthesia for my own horses. Um, so I think that, that probably says quite a lot. Um, I think the other thing that CPEF 2 achieved was pointing out some associations between a drug or a procedure or a time of day and the increased likelihood of death. So the, there was the association between um, a surgery that took a long time was more likely to end up in a dead horse. Surgery that was not urgent but out of hours, i.e. you've got tired people, you've got the B team, um, they were more likely to cause a death. And the interesting one that came up was the association with the, the using the pre-medication ace promazine, which is a, uh, well, you could say it's a very old fashioned phenothiazine drug. There seemed to be an association with a decreased likelihood of death from cardiovascular problems if they'd had a pre-med with ACP. Lots of people wouldn't really believe that, um, but it, it, it was very clear and it came up again in CPEF3. So th there are things like that that we learnt um, that people t began to make use of in how they would anaesthetise horses in the meantime. But then, you know, we've got 20 years and we, we don't know what people are doing instead, which is why then when we've now got onto CPEF 4, which is going to tell us what people are doing differently and indeed what the death rate is. So that, you know, the, the, the data from that are coming out now, but we haven't, we haven't got all the answers. And, and it does look as though we are doing some things better and we're certainly using different drugs. Another point about um, CPEF4 is the international collaboration and the, the, the very reason why I'm here in Valencia now. Um, CPEF2 was primarily Mark Johnson and I was involved as his PhD supervisor and two people from the Animal Health Trust where I was working at the time um, were in, also involved particularly from the statistical analysis but it was all very much in the UK. I think with technology that we have now of being able to talk to people all around the world, that has enabled um, much more collaboration. And there's huge advantages of having other nationalities involved. Um, there's cultural differences. There's uh, just the way day-to-day -day life is different. And you are going to have what, lots of thinking outside the box, lateral thinking that comes into a project that's got um, points of view from different places. We've all got the goal of improving equine anaesthesia, but we all approach it from a slightly different way. We've got lots of input from um, Australia and USA from clinics. Um, so it, it, it's a pretty international project. And then what are the future? Do we need CPEF 5, 6, 7? Well, I think there's two points here. One of them, particularly when we get the web-based system going, we are going to have a phenomenal tool for collecting this sort of data. And based on that, an awful lot of individual investigations can be made. You can look at how one clinic compares with another. You can look at how one drug compares with another. You can look at different processes, different procedures. Um, and there's a huge amount of data there that could be used to teach us what we're doing and how to do better. There is the argument that, you know, we're going to um, get a lot of information out of CPEF 4 and we can make anaesthesia safer. I don't think we're ever going to make it 100% safe. And at the moment, we're not, you know, 0.6% is still quite high. So we have, are going to have to go on trying to improve. So my feeling about the future 
is that we should try and do some sort of data collection on a regular basis to see how we're doing, where the new areas of problem lie, or what's worked really well, so that we can then pass that on as international guidelines or uh, ways of helping with teaching and so forth. And so my, my feeling is that we should be doing CPEF 5 in, well, I've sort of come up with seven years, because five years is a bit too short, because by the time you've collected the data and assessed it, you're going to be almost at five years, but 10 feels a bit too long. So I think that we should be trying to have a system that we use the, the model that we've got, the, the method that we've got to generate CPEF 5 data, CPEF 6 data and so on, um, in order to continue to improve the quality and the safety of equine anaesthesia and to use it for teaching, we might possibly flag up a problem that a particular clinic might have and somebody could be um, encouraged to go and help them sort that problem out. There's a, there's a huge potential. Um, the question will be, how does that get funded and who's going to do it? The work that Nacho and Miguel are doing at the moment and the two IT guys is phenomenal. We've got to think a way of how it could continue and that we're discussing at the moment. Um, I think it should involve the equine industry and somebody has suggested it probably should in include the insurance industry because they are actually getting a lot of useful information in how to set what you pay to insure your horse when it's going to have surgery. So there's lots of potential um, and my feeling is it's definitely worthwhile. Mm -hmm.